Hello, everyone, and welcome to Introduction to R Part 8, Data Frames. So in this video, we are going to be going over what data frames are, and they are essentially an extension of the list data structure that we learned about last time. So they're able to hold different data types, but they're specifically designed to hold tabular data, such as the data you might find in an Excel sheet, where there's a specific number of rows and columns. So to create a data frame, you can use the data.frame function. In this code cell, we're showing how to create a data frame from, from a few different vectors. So we're creating a vector A with some numbers, five numbers to be exact, a vector B with some characters, and a vector C with some logical values. And then we're using the data.frame function to take those three vectors as input and save them in this variable my frame and then we're going to see what it looks like after we've made the data frame here you can see that r prints out a tabular data structure and it shows the columns here and we didn't um, give any names to the rows so there are no row names listed but we can see the column names at the top here a b and c which were the names of the variables we passed in in this case. Um, if we wanted to give the columns different names at the time of creation, we could use this construction. So similar to the list construction, data.frame, if you want to use, say, numeric as the name of the first column, we'd use that as the name and set it equal to the values. Character, logical, so now these will be the names of the columns instead of A, B, and C. We'll run that. Um, you can check and reassign the column names after creating the data frame. So this call names function, you pass in a data frame as the argument, and that will show you the column names. And you can also use this call names function to reassign the names. So this first one is just showing us what the names are. And the second one here, we're actually using the assignment operator to give the columns new names. So here we're giving them the names C1, C2, C3, and we're just checking them again with this third call, so we'll see that. These are the original column names, and then we renamed them to these. Um, similar to lists and matrices, you can also have named rows. Well, not lists, but matrices. You can have named rows with data frames, and if you want named rows, you just pass this extra row.names argument when you create the data frame. So here we're saying we also want named rows, row.names, and we're giving just some generic row names in this case. But when we run that and look at the data frame, we see that now there are these row names listed here instead of just having something blank on that side. Um, again, you can check and reassign row names after creating the data frame. So here we're doing essentially the same operation as above. We're just assigning, we're checking the row names, and then we're giving them new row names, just the values one through five in this case, and we're checking it again. So when you load data into R, it will often be in the form of a data frame. R even has some toy data sets built in that you can play around with that are data frames. So one of those data sets is the MT cars data set. So if you want to interact with the MT cars data set in R, you just simply type MT cars because it's saved as that. So here we're just restoring it in a different variable named cars and looking at it. And it just provides some data you can toy around with to try different things. But in general, when you're loading data into R, it'll, it will often be in the form of a data frame. So it's very good to know how to work with them. Now, when you're loading in a new data frame, you'll often want to summarize it and get a sense of its overall structure before doing anything else like plotting or predictive modeling. It's just a way of getting a sense of what the data you're working with looks like and its structure. So there's a few um, convenient functions for doing that. One of them is str or structure. Um, we learned about this with some of the other uh, data types we've used. But with data frames, if you run structure, it will show you the number of observations, the number of variables, and provide a brief little summary for each column. So it'll tell you the type of the column, 
in this case the mpg column for instance is numeric and that will just show you a few of the first values so you can get a sense of kind of the types of values or the range of values that tend to be stored um this mpg or this uh empty cars data set all the columns happen to be numeric so we see num 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 but if it was a different data set you might have char characters in here or logicals or other things like that another common function is the summary function um this will basically take all your numeric columns and provide basic summary statistics for each one showing the maximum minimum and median values and things of that nature and the average so let's run that the empty cars data set since they're all numeric this works on every single column and this just gives you a good immediate sense of the spread of the data and the typical values that each column has and you can also use the head and tail functions these essentially break off the first few rows of the last few rows of a data set so the head function here we're take we're getting the first five rows of empty cars by using head and this tail function we're getting the last five rows that's just a quick way of looking at a few rows without looking at the entire data set because usually you're not going to be wanting to print large data sets to the screen it's a nice thing to know and some other functions that can be useful dim again we learned this for matrices it works on data frames as well it just checks the dimensions of the data frame um, n row gets you the number of rows and n call gets you the number of columns there they are and you can also index into data frames using similar indexing operations that we've learned for other data structures under the hood data frames are built on top of lists so all the indexing operations we learned for lists also work for data frames but regardless we'll run through a few examples of how you can do that um so just using single brackets with a number inside will select a column slice of that numbered column so that actually returns a list and not the the type of the data in that column it returns a new list instead so we'll run that and show that it's it gives you the column weight in this case because that's the sixth column but it's actually a list so it's like a data frame still but only with one column and sometimes that's not what you want sometimes you'll actually want this weight column with numeric data in it so to do that you use double brackets instead and when we check the type of that, we should actually grab the values in there so that it should be numeric or double, which is a numeric data type. Um, you can also get columns using the quotation notation or dollar sign notation with the column names. So in this case, we're getting the weight column using the quoted string of the name instead of using a number. And same thing here, here, we're using the dollar sign with the name of the column unquoted. Both of those will grab the values in that column just like we did up here with the number. And this is just showing some different ways of indexing. Uh, if you want a specific value in a data frame, you use brackets with comma separated values. So in this case, we're getting the value at row two, column six this case we're getting the value of row two and we're actually not specifying a value so that means we're getting the whole row so that's the whole second row in this case it's the whole sixth column because there's no value before the comma and again you can use names instead of index numbers so this one gets the row of the Mazda RX4 and this will get the whole MPG column let's run those and show what the results would be And the various logical indexing operations that we've learned about already work with data frames as well. So you can do things like, for instance, this call, we're taking the cars, and for the row column, for the, for the rows, we're passing in cars where the MPG is greater than 25. So this will grab all the rows where that's the case, where the MPG is greater than 25. So these 
are essentially the cars that have fairly good gas mileage that we get back from that. And you can make subsets of data frames using this subset function. Um, it's similar to doing essentially what we just did above, but it has its own special syntax. You essentially use the subset function. First, you pass in the data set. So in this case, the cars data set we're using. And then you can just specify several logical operations combined with ands or ors and get back whatever results from that. So in this case, we're taking a subset of the cars data frame where MPG is greater than 20 and horsepower is greater than 70. So this is essentially getting cars with fairly good gas mileage, but also that at least have a little bit of horsepower. Like this might be a pretty low number. Maybe all the cars would have at least 70 horsepower. I'm not sure. Oh no, some of them don't. Let's see what we get back from that. And similar to the matrix functions, C bind and R bind, um, you can combine data frames using those. If you have, say, two different data frames with the same columns but different rows, you can use rbind, for instance, to just paste them together so you have one longer data set. It looks like there's not code here for that, but you can do that. Um, and you can remove columns from a data frame by assigning the column name null. So here we're saying in the cars data set, the versus the or the vs column null that's dropping that column same here we're dropping the carb column so after we do that those two columns will be gone see they have disappeared and now we only have nine um, variables and again you can use uh, the same indexing operations we've learned in this case we're using the negative sign to drop specific rows from the data set so we're resaving cars, but only with the cars that are not in row position one or three. That's what the minus does. It's saying instead of getting row position one and three, we're saying get everything other than row position one and three. So this is basically just dropping those two rows. So when we run this, we should get the data frame without those two rows. Um, we'd have to look up above to see which ones the first and third were, but they should be gone there. So that is a general introduction to data frames. Um, but there is one quirk with how data frames are constructed. When you pass in a character vector for one of the columns, the data frame constructor will actually make that column into what's known as a factor instead of a character column. You can see if we run type on the frame on the data frame we made earlier if we run type of on the character column it says it's an integer and not a character which is weird because we actually passed in a character vector for that and it turns out that um, the data frame constructor by default takes character strings and saves them saves character data as factors which under the hood is stored as integer that's why it says integer here but Factors are basically just a special data type that are meant to encode categorical variables. So that's the default behavior that d the data frame function does. If you don't want it to do that and you just want to keep characters as characters, when you make a data frame, you have to pass in this extra argument here, strings as factors equals false. And when you run that, um, your characters uh, vectors will remain characters. So we'll just run this and check the type of to confirm that it remains a character. So that's correct. Um, so in the next lesson, we will actually go in and learn about what fact more about what factors are. And um, after doing that, you will have a better sense of whether it is reasonable behavior to have the data frame function by default convert your character strings into factors. So we'll look forward to the next lesson, guys.